And uh, just out of curiosity, we always do this little informal survey in the beginning. Just like to know how many of you are, you are new to this. Uh, this is your first event that you've attended with us. So we have a fair number of new people this time around. That's good. So I just want to tell you just quickly what Snow Search is all about. We're a group of concerned citizens made up of scientists, some writers, educators, uh, and other professionals. And we're concerned about the future of climate change and sea level rise and the impact it's going to have on our community and the, the other surrounding towns. And we're trying to get the uh, ball rolling here relative to awareness <clears throat> and uh, put a little bit of pressure from the bottom up on our public officials to start thinking about uh, maybe making some changes and doing things differently so that we can accommodate what lies ahead. There's a certain amount of climate momentum that's going on here that our forefathers generated uh, carbon and put it in the atmosphere, and that stuff's up there and it's trapping heat, and you know, we're gonna get some sea level rise, we're gonna get some intense storms, and that's already in the cards. So the question is, what do we do from here on in into the future? Anyway, what I'd like to do is get the program rolling, and to introduce our speaker, I'd like to introduce our, my fellow Storm Surge member and our first speaker of the series, Bill Sargent, who's going to introduce Bill for us. I mean, Rob. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike, and uh, I think everybody realizes what a fantastic job Mike has been doing heading up this organization, and particularly today when he was testifying before the EPA in, in Boston. He, he sort of embodies what this group is about. He's the perfect person to be head of it because he owns a house on, on Plum Island. Uh, he has some scientific background. He's been surfing out here. And he really knows, knows the issues from, from the bottom up. Uh, and so he's a perfect person to sort of have this broad-based coalition. And one of the things that we're trying to do is bring scientists to the, uh, to the area to help us figure out what we can do. We've got some real problems uh, that we have to deal with. So today, we're extremely fortunate to have uh, Rob Teeler, uh, who is uh, going to, he's from the US Geological Survey down in Woods Hole. And he's going to be telling us a little bit about some of the uh, coastal changes because of, of climate change. Uh, Rob was an undergraduate at Dickinson College, and then he went to Duke. And uh, you probably know Duke is the place to go for, for coastal geology. His thesis uh, 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 professor was uh, Oren Pilkey, and I know we've been talking about Oren Pilkey uh, on our site quite a bit. Uh, he's just a wonderful guy, and we've actually been talking about perhaps we can get him to come up and, and speak to us. Uh, I've only been to Duke once. Uh, and I was driving the Harvard debating team. I, I couldn't debate for anything, but I was the only guy who had a car. So they made me the designated, uh, designated driver. And we drove up to this beautiful campus, and we were going through the, uh, the cafeteria line, and, the, and the, one of the serving ladies said, well, where do y'all boys come from? And uh, where do you go to school? And I said, well, we're, we're at Harvard University. And it was kind of this blank look. And, I said, well, that's sort of the Duke of the North. And then she underwent <laughs> So without further nonsense, I'd like to introduce Rob. Thank you. It's really nice to be here up in the uh, frigid north. I'm uh, two degrees of latitude from Woods Hole uh, this afternoon on a lonely fall afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a bit tonight about uh, what, as, as Mike and Bill both mentioned, are uh, changing climate and changing coasts. What, what climate has in store for us uh, in terms of coastal change as we move into uh, the future? And in some cases, this is a future that we are already carving uh, and will experience directly. Uh, in some cases, it's a future that uh, our children and grandchildren will see. Uh, <coughs> I'll talk a little bit more about the, the various time scales and what things we need to be concerned about as we move the talk. Uh, about four parts to this talk this evening. Uh, the first is a little bit of background on the scientific dimensions and the management dimensions of uh, sea level change, results and some implications for us uh, about recent sea level rise, uh, from recent sea level rise assessments, some of which I've participated in uh, directly, some of which I, I've just gleaned from my colleagues and, and uh, <coughs> other folks I work with, 
And one of the key messages uh, I want to leave you with tonight is there is a lot of uncertainty about climate change. It is a certain impact. I and mean, sea level rise is actually probably the most certain impact of climate change. Uh, we are locked into a certain amount of sea level rise just because of the physics of the ocean atmosphere system. Uh, but it's also an uncertain impact. And the timing and, and the magnitude of certain changes are, are not well known. And it is our job as scientists, particularly me, particularly uh, for people like me who work for the federal government uh, in the US Geological Survey, to provide science-based decision support for communities and other federal agencies uh, that, that address, that are relevant to dealing with this uncertainty. Uh, and then I'll, I'll share with you uh, how one little town, the town where I live, Falmouth, uh, Massachusetts, is starting to address this issue in what we think is, a, is an interesting and holistic way, and we've taken some baby steps uh, to get there. And I'll share those with you. Uh, uh, as most of you know, uh, <coughs> the coast of the United States, especially the, the Atlantic and the Gulf, but also uh, the West Coast is some of the most densely populated that we have uh, in the U.S. At the same time, uh, coastal erosion affects all 30 uh, coastal uh, U.S. states. About 60% uh, to 80% of the coast is actively eroding or uh, migrating landward. And it, there are a variety of complex, diverse processes that are responsible for this erosion, but there's an overwhelming trend of erosion around the United States. And there are a lot of people and uh, a lot of infrastructure, uh, obviously, at risk from these changes. Uh, one of the folks I've, I've worked with in the past, his name is David Carter. He is the, the head of the Coastal Zone Management Program in the state of Delaware. And in talking to Dave, our conversations usually start with uh, a demand from a manager to a scientist. Says, we need better science to uh, prepare our local responses to climate change, especially in coastal areas. And I, I asked there is science up there because what Dave means by science is not necessarily people running around doing research that you can't relate to, but people uh, <clears throat> who can improve his understanding of the basic processes that are changing the coast of Delaware. These are all shots from the coast of Delaware. It's a very diverse coast. Uh, some of these scenes may look familiar to you. They have lowland flooding, they have eroding beaches. They receive storm impacts, and they also have, uh, in the Port of Wilmington, uh, many millions of dollars of uh, infrastructure and uh, port facilities at or at or sea level. So he wants a better understanding of the threats that are posed by different climate processes, uh, <coughs> and translate those into what uh, I will term better situation awareness. That is. If he, as a manager, takes a particular course of action to protect a certain resource or protect some infrastructure, what options does that take off the table because he's chosen this particular management action? What long-term costs are associated with those kinds of actions so that he can make a decision uh, that balances the pros and cons and the economic and environmental costs associated with any decision he needs to make? Uh, so it's our job as scientists to give him enough information to make these kinds of decisions with as full of a set of information uh, <clears throat> many of you know, and especially here in, in the more low-lying areas uh, <clears throat> in this part of Massachusetts, you experience shallow coastal flooding. Uh, a really good example of, of an urban, urban impact of, of shallow coastal flooding is uh, highlighted by the city of Charleston, South Carolina, which currently, today, issues shallow coastal flooding advisories for seven-foot tides. And these are tides that happen a couple times a year when the wind is blowing in the right way and there's a full moon or a new moon, so it's a spring tide plus a storm coming along from the right direction. Uh, they typically occur a couple of times a year. With about a foot and a half of sea level rise, however, this advisory could be issued 355 times per year. Uh, and it would flood these uh, blue areas here on the uh, Charleston Peninsula. Uh, <coughs> this obviously creates a situation and some of these 355 times are for both high tides during, during the day. So this could be a couple times a day, and it will be a lot of times during the year that this, this will occur. Uh, two takeaways from this. One, you need a good set of rubber boots, and you need to make sure that all of your infrastructure is above flooding, uh, or your electrical line and the analysis is subject to a lot of saltwater intrusion. The other is, it's an open question as to how many people will actually stick around to experience this. When do people give up? When is it too much for people? When is it too much for society to uh, build back in the face of this uh, increasingly frequent flood? Uh, it may be that the whole city of Charleston decides, or much of the city of Charleston decides, that maybe 60 to 80 times per year that this is really an untenable situation. We have to mitigate our way out of it, or back our way out of it, or do something different. Uh, <coughs> 
So it illustrates a, a little bit of the, the sense of scale and the sense of uh, repetitiveness of, of some of these differential impacts. Uh, there are a few key principles regarding sea level rise, which, we'll which I'll focus on for the body of the talk. Uh, one is that there is no debate over sea level rise. Uh, when the climate warms, as it uh, has been since the height of the last glaciation 21,000 years ago, the air temperature gets warmer, land-based ice melts into the sea, it adds to the volume of the global ocean, and at the same time, the ocean increases in volume because the ocean itself is warming. Warmer water expands and it takes up more volume. About half of the sea level rise that we expect over the next hundred or so years is going to be from the melting of glaciers and ice sheets, and about half uh, is going to come from the thermal expansion of the oceans. And there's other little bits and pieces that come from other things, but those are the big two. Uh, in many respects, the attribution of sea level rise is largely a unfair relevant. Is it human-induced climate change? Is it not human-induced climate change? Is it sun? Is it the moon? Is it the what? It uh, doesn't really matter. If the world stopped emitting greenhouse gases tomorrow, for example, sea level would continue to rise, albeit at a reduced rate, because we're not loading the atmosphere with carbon dioxide and warming the atmosphere anymore, for several centuries. Uh, so the major questions are how much is sea level rise going, uh, how much is sea level going to rise, and how fast is it going to rise? Is it going to happen tomorrow? Is it going to happen in a years? Does the curve look flat like this? Does it look like this? Is there after 2050, it's going to go up very dramatically. Uh, and the answers to these questions depend in part on our future emissions pathways and, uh, and in part on an improving understanding of the future behavior of the large ice sheets, principally Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, what causes sea level to change are basically these, as I've said. One is the expansion of warm water. Uh, as the ocean warms, it, it takes up uh, more space. And land-based ice melting down and, and arriving at the sea from glaciers and ice sheets. Uh, the land can also rise or sink. Large deltas, like the Mississippi Delta, uh, is actually sinking, partly because there's not as much sediment coming in to build the delta anymore. Also because sediments when they're deposited in the delta, like the Mississippi, compact naturally because there's an amount of water that slowly is taken out. Uh, we changed uh, the levels of the land rising or sinking by removing water, uh, the storage of land water behind dams or large natural lakes. Uh, and whether that is increasing or decreasing can change the level of the ocean. And ocean currents can actually influence uh, how much sea level rise you experience uh, in the long term. So all these things cause the sea level to change. Uh, <coughs> with that in mind, and keeping in mind that the big thing is, is really about ice and global temperature, here is a uh, graph that shows uh, changes in the global, uh, <coughs> changes from the global average temperature over the last 20,000 years. Now this scale is a little weird. It starts, this is 10,000 years here, and then it's 8,000 years here, and then 1,000. So it's sort of a quasi-log scale here, and this is just degrees centigrade uh, change from the global average. And what's important here is about 20,000 years ago, we're right at the end of the last ice age, and the global average temperature is about five degrees cooler than uh, they are at present. And as we exited the last glaciation, and where we are sitting now was covered by ice, uh, quite a bit of it, a mile or so, uh, that ice began to melt and the earth began to warm up for a few thousand years and then it got very cold again for a little while. Glaciers re-advanced in, in Europe and gave rise to the term the Younger Dryas for a glacial re-advance and for a flower over in Europe. Uh, and then the glaciation really ended and global temperatures increased very rapidly uh, for several uh, thousand years until you get to about eight or, eight or so thousand years ago and since that time Global average temperatures have been very stable. And from the standpoint of humans as a civilization, uh, this has been a wonderful time to be a human. Uh, this, uh, this stable climate has allowed uh, human civilization to spread across the globe. Uh, it allowed for the development of agriculture, it allowed for the development of large ports from which we seafared out to new worlds uh, all across the globe. Uh, there have been little bumps and wiggles. It got warm in the medieval for a little while. The Vikings came over and called Greenland green. Uh, then it got cold, and uh, Hans Christian Andersen was writing about skating on the canals uh, <coughs> over in the Netherlands. But in general, the, the global temperature has not changed very much at all. Uh, until we get up to the present in about 1940, and then you can see the historical record here up to about now. Uh, and now on the far right, you can see uh, 
this is the uh, IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Projection for 2007. Uh, a new one just came out a couple weeks ago. The numbers are not terribly different uh, than this. Uh, but they predict by 2100 a global range of about 2.4 to 6.4 degrees centigrade warmer than uh, the current global average. And what you can see here is, one, it's potentially a lot warmer. Even 2.4 C is a lot warmer than it's been for the last several thousand years. The other thing is that modern humans have no direct experience with a global average temperature like this. Uh, we are entering, in all likelihood, a truly new world that we, as a human civilization, have not experienced directly. Uh, and there are all kinds of changes associated with this time of warming uh, <clears throat> that we're beginning to unravel from our study of the past. Um, most of you may be aware that the global average rate of sea level rise over the last 100 years or so has been about 1.7 millimeters per year, so not very much. Uh, and the rate over the last 20 or so years is about 3.2 millimeters per year, nearly double what the 100 year rate is. Uh, this graph shows the rate of sea level rise during that last deglaciation. These, this is a slightly different time scale, uh, but when you get to about here, 8,000 years ago to the present, it's basically the same. This is radiocarbon years, <coughs> which in older ages are not calendar years, but that's not really important to this. Um, but what you can see is the rate of sea level rise as we came out of that large glaciation. Here is the Laurentide ice sheet sitting over the top of North America. Here's Greenland. Uh, we're under this white line here. Um, as the rate of sea level rise began to increase, this ice mass was getting smaller and smaller. It was being dumped into the ocean. The rate of sea level rise, uh, <clears throat> when the climate initially warmed, went way up. The rate of sea level rise was over 40 millimeters per year for probably a century or so. Uh, 40 millimeters per year, or 4 centimeters per year, is you know, stand on the beach and watch it come up around your ankles kind of fast. Um, and you can see that the ice was much reduced, much of the sea level rise uh, came from uh, melting of the northern hemisphere ice sheets. Then it got cooler again during this younger driest period, and the, uh, the rate of sea level rise dropped down below about 10 millimeters per year. Then it started to warm up again. There was another big, what they call meltwater pulse, which is a big catastrophic uh, failure of, of the ice sheets and warming. Um, and the rate of sea level rise again approached something like 30 millimeters a year for a few years. Then we began to run out of ice. Most of the ice on the northern hemisphere was gone. Most of what we think melted out of West Antarctica was gone by then. And the rate of sea level rise began to decrease. And at about 8,500 years ago, the rate of sea level rise dropped below about 10 or 12 millimeters per year. And it is around this time that all the major global uh, deltas in the world began to form. This is the Mississippi, the Amazon, the Andes, Brahma, Putra, uh, Tigris, th think of a big river, and it originated in its modern form right in this window from about 8,500 to 6,500 years ago. Uh, a major reason for this is that the rate of sea level rise was sufficiently low that all the sediment coming from these rivers could now be deposited into these big delta landforms, and the Mississippi could grow its giant uh, expanse of, of delta and wetlands and all that, and the same with the Amazon and everything else. So this was a period of time where there was a lot of uh, proactive coastal growth because the rate of sea level rise had slowed down because we ran out of ice. And over the last five or 6,000 years, by the time we get to about 5,000 years ago, the rate of sea level rise is very close to zero, uh, probably less than a millimeter or so per year. And it is in this last 5,000 year period, four or 5,000 year period, where we see the formation of the coast as we know it today, the broad, extensive wetland system including the ones right out here. Uh, <clears throat> the barrier islands that ring half of the United States coastline from about uh, Long Island down around the Gulf and certain parts of the West Coast as well, all formed in this uh, period of time. So in a geologic perspective, these are fairly recent phenomena. Uh, <clears throat> but importantly, they have formed and flourished in a regime of very slow, almost non-existent sea level. And we expect that regime of slow, almost non-existent sea level rise to end. Uh, and what I'm showing here is over the last 2,000 years, we have estimates of the rate of sea level rise from the geologic past based on uh, carbon dating and other methods of dating corals in the marsh sediments that, that uh, I was just talking about. And you can see there's, there's this blue band which shows a very low rate of sea level rise. This gray band is just the uncertainty of those geologic estimates because we're going out and taking cores and corals and taking uh, cores of marshes and dating. Um, then at the, uh, towards the end of the 19th century, we started to install uh, tide gauges around the world. 
and a composite record of those shows a lot of ups and downs, and there are a variety of reasons for those ups and downs uh, that have to do with, with climate changes and changes in ocean circulation and things like that. But you can see that that rate of sea level rise, which again these gauges have measured as, over the last 100 years as being about 1.7 millimeters per year, is beginning to depart even from the uncertainty envelope of the last 2,000 years. So we're already seeing uh, a rate of sea level rise that is exceeding the uh, rate over the last 2,000 years at least. And what we're looking at potentially in the future is a rate, this is just one set of projections, but it's representative of an envelope of projections, including the IPCC's report that came out last week, uh, no, a couple weeks ago. Uh, <clears throat> and you can see even at the low end, we're, we're uh, projecting potentially a, a rate of sea level rise of seven or so millimeters per year at the high end, uh, greater than 20 millimeters per year by the end of the century. And there's a uh, big uptick in here. And where will we end up here? We don't really know yet. Uh, <clears throat> some people think it's probably going to be at the higher end uh, of these kinds of rates. And these are rates, again, that humans have no direct experience with. Uh, the rate of relative sea level rise in the Mississippi is right around 10 millimeters per year today. Uh, just for reference, that's one of the highest rates of sea level rise in the world. Uh, so projected out to 2100, this is from the IPCC report that came out a couple weeks ago, uh, which showed two scenarios in which we do a lot to mitigate climate change in the future and do very little to mitigate climate change in the future. And these are the resulting sea level rises and some uncertainties with them. However, as, as pointed out uh, by Aslak Winstead uh, <coughs> over in uh, Europe, uh, because of the conservative nature of the IPCC's IPCC's projections and the language that they use to express these, the worst case scenario is actually worse than nearly a meter by 2100. It's actually probably a realistic estimate for worst case is about 1.6 or 1.7 meters by 2100. Uh, <clears throat> so we're, we're talking, and even in, in the, the better cases here where it's uh, held to under 20 centimeters or under a foot, this is, this is about a foot right here, uh, it's still a lot of sea level rise well, relative to what's happened uh, over the last several centuries. You can see the number of uh, projections uh, go up uh, to uh, almost uh, about two meters by, by the year 2100. And these come from a variety of techniques. Some are uh, related to physical processes that we know about how glaciers and ice sheets work. Some are uh, based on changes to the atmosphere. Some are based on just uh, reasonable estimates. Uh, so there's physics, non-physics, semi-empirical approaches, etc. Uh, but they all have and almost all of them have in common a meter plus by the time of the One of the interesting things about sea level is it doesn't rise uniformly over the globe. Uh, <clears throat> when we had a big ice sheet 21,000 years ago sitting here, and we're up in here somewhere, uh, <clears throat> this large mass of ice at the North Pole and at the South Pole, roughly, actually cause the earth to squash outward like you're sitting on a yoga ball or squashing a beach ball between your hands when you squash the poles, the top and the bottom, the middle bulges out. That's exactly what happens when you put a big mass of ice on the North Pole and a big mass of ice on the South Pole. And when you remove that, you stand up off the yoga ball, it returns slowly to a spherical shape. And what happens is the land up here, the center of the ice in the Northern Hemisphere was up in Hudson Bay. And the land is actually rising faster, much faster than sea level is rising. So there's actually new land being created on an annual basis uh, up in Hudson Bay. You can see stranded beaches that you can walk down them for several miles uh, <coughs> up in Hudson Bay. But what happens to the middle, or in this case, the middle of the northern hemisphere, is it's collapsing, what they call a glacial forebulge collapse. And where that collapse is happening most dramatically is off the east coast of the U.S. This is North Carolina right here. This is where the maximum rate of uh, change of, of that rebound is occurring. So in addition to sea level rising, uh, because the ice is melting the land, in many places is also sinking, simply by the act of adding or removing ice from the poles of the planet. Uh, <clears throat> another interesting thing uh, is, this is West Antarctica. Continent of Antarctica, we're looking up at the bottom of the globe here. Um, very large ice masses have a gravitational attraction. Like any large body, they have a certain amount of gravitational attraction, such that as you, as you steam south from, say, San Francisco down to uh, West Antarctica, 
you're actually going up a very low slope over about a thousand kilometers or so. It's because this giant ice mass has a gravitational attraction that's actually attracting the ocean towards it. And when you melt that ice out, there's not as much gravitational attraction, so the water tends to spread out. It spreads out over the global ocean. <coughs> to the point where, relative to the rest of the globe, uh, if West Antarctica were to melt out tomorrow or over the next hundred years, the sea level around West Antarctica would actually go down. Uh, but where this water distributes to around the global ocean is in a roughly circumglobal band at 41 degrees north latitude. How many people know what latitude we're at right now? Just about 43, which is a hop, a skip, and a jump. From, uh, 41 is actually just south of Martha's Bay. It's uh, due east of Montauk on that, uh, in Massachusetts terms. Uh, and at 41 degrees north latitude, you get free 25% more sea level rise than the rest of the world. Uh, and that's this red band here, where relative to the rest of the world, you get 25% more sea level rise. So if West Antarctica melts out first, uh, we get a lot of sea level rise up here. If Greenland uh, melts out more rapidly, sea level around Greenland, including uh, some effects as far south as probably the middle of the mid Atlantic of the US, certainly New York, uh, sea level will begin to go down and the effect will be mitigated. So there's this contest between meltwater sources that will determine how water is distributed over the global ocean over the next century and beyond, where we potentially stand to have a lot of sea level rise if West Antarctica is more important than Greenland. And mixing and matching of these things is something geodynamicists you now do uh, to monitor ice loss and where the, where the water is actually coming from. Uh, we can also have regional variability in sea level rise. Uh, these are just, uh, this is a model example of uh, what happens off of New York if the Gulf Stream slows down. One of the outcomes of climate change is a projected decrease in the vigor of the Gulf Stream, or what they call the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC. Uh, <coughs> Gulf Stream. Not <laughs> 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 uh, But uh, one of the outcomes of that. Uh, is that the Gulf Stream slows down. And the Gulf Stream is a very strong current, and when it's running strongly, sea level is actually set down at the coast. The water is actually domed up under the most rapidly flowing part uh, of this current. And when it slows down, uh, sea level goes up at the coast. So if we have a uh, slowdown in the Gulf Stream, we can expect sea level from about Cape Hatteras northward up to Boston uh, <coughs> to go up in excess of whatever the uh, normal uh, sea level rise might be. So what I hope to have uh, communicated is there are interesting things going on at the global scale, there are interesting things going on at the regional scale, and it can be rising or sinking for a variety of uh, reasons, ocean currents can be slowing down, and ultimately that all impacts what we do at the local scale. And in this case, I'm using local scale uh, is the, uh, the Port of Oakland, California, which has uh, just a few billion dollars worth of infrastructure sitting about this high above sea level. Uh, there are airports here, uh, much of our commerce comes in and out of uh, that part of the world. So this is an important local uh, place to, to pay attention to these kinds of processes. In addition to that spatial scale, from global down to local, there's also a temporal scale, a time scale, where we see the uh, movement of the shoreline in response to storms, where a storm might come in and erode back several feet, and then over the succeeding summer, maybe succeeding years even, uh, the shoreline will build back, and then it'll erode again, and come back. But what we see overwhelmingly Remember one of the early slides I showed you, 60-80% of the U.S. coast and most of the global coast is also eroding. this long-term trend of erosion. Uh, <clears throat> and the short term is, is things like storm impact and annual cycles, El Nino, especially on the west coast. Uh, but there's this long-term trend which is driven by sediment deficits or surpluses, things that sediment is being added or not added, uh, and of course sea level rise. So this is the long-term trend and we have this noise on top of it. And certainly some of what happens uh, on barrier islands like Plum Island and, and other barriers is like this. It comes and it goes, but there is this long-term trend of uh, land removal and eroding on the shoreline. Uh, a few years ago, I was involved in a study uh, <coughs> as part of the U.S. Climate, China, climate Change Science Program. Uh, we looked specifically at the Mid-Atlantic region from North Carolina up to uh, New York, but the lessons here are very generic and, and apply uh, <coughs> to this part of the world as well. One of the 
important things we noticed was that the quality of elevation data, which could give you a very crude first cut at what potential impacts might be just based on your elevation, which as I'll point out, uh, is not the whole story, uh, isn't very good. Um, older sources of data, the US Geological Survey's uh, 30 meter digital elevation model compiled from old topographic maps uh, showed a 95% confidence, which is something you might want to be pretty confident about if you have the own property or your county planner out here. The dark blue areas are areas where we're positive based on the quality of the data. 95% certain that those areas are a meter or so uh, above sea level. But these large light blue areas are areas that may or may not, just based on the quality of the data, uh, be within a meter of sea level. But fortunately, we now use, uh, the scientific community is uh, increasingly using LIDAR data. This is light detection and ranging. This is uh, laser altimetry, typically done from flying an airplane with a laser and taking shots of the ground in very high density processing the data. What you can see is we have significantly reduced the area of uncertainty. So if you were a manager out here and you didn't know whether you might experience a flooding impact, say, from a storm event, uh, because of the quality of your elevation data was now you're very certain uh, <coughs> that you are above that, that one meter threshold. So just based on data quality, we, we have a better, improving data quality, we have a better understanding of areas that might be at risk or not. Uh, but the coast, obviously, uh, especially for those of you uh, who live adjacent to it, is not like a bathtub. It is not simply adding melt water and warming the water and having it rise up. <coughs> there is uh, a variety, there are a variety of processes uh, that occur. There's cliff erosion. Uh, this is specific to California, just south of San Francisco, where about 20 centimeters of sea level rise over the last 100 years uh, looks something like this. Uh, but there is long-term cliff retreat. If this was simply a sea level rising up against the cliff and the cliff didn't do anything, sure, it would be very much like a bathtub. But actually, as the sea level rises, of course, it chews away at the land, the cliff fails, houses falling, uh, and all that. Uh, this is the southwestern portion of Nantucket, where there's been uh, over a quarter of a mile of shoreline retreat uh, since the mid-1800s, uh, <coughs> up a fairly steep slope and into some, uh, obviously, some old glacial deposits. Um, and that has happened over the last hundred or so years uh, um, in response to just a quarter of a meter of sea level rise. So there's not a, a very simple relationship. It's actually much more exciting than that. Uh, we like to think of beaches as uh, existing in a dynamic equilibrium involving four factors, where there is sediment supply, that is the quantity, how much sand or rock or mud or whatever uh, is involved in, this, in a particular beach system, uh, and what is its quality, how much is boulders, how much is not, um, whether relative sea level rise is rising, the relative sea level change is rising or falling, are you sitting on land that is rising out like the Pacific Northwest, faster than the rate of sea level rise, and sitting land like the Mississippi that is sinking in addition to sea level rise, or some mixture of those. How much energy is in the system to move this sediment around? All these things are going to determine the shape and location of the beach and barrier islands on the landscape. So it's a very dynamic, exciting place, which also makes it, as a scientist, very challenging to predict how all these things interact and where they're going to go in the future. Uh, so part of what we did for this study was look at the Mid-Atlantic and <coughs> We identified uh, three different sea level rise rates. We assumed that sea level rise would stay the same. It would increase by about two millimeters per year, or it would increase by about seven millimeters per year. And what we identified is, is what a colleague of mine calls the uh, gradient of increasing madness, <laughs> which goes from the upper left down into the lower right, where we have things. Uh, well, certainly on mainland coasts, we expect more bluff erosion uh, as sea level rise continues. Um, and then on, on barrier island coasts, uh, <coughs> In various pit coasts, we expect more overwash, island breaching, and eventually getting to this thing we designate now here in the lower right hand corner is T, the threshold crossing. This is the northern end of Assateague Island, Maryland, this is the city of Maryland. Uh, these islands were one island prior to the, to the 1933 hurricane that opened this inlet, which was subsequently stabilized by the Army Corps of Engineers with a pair of jetties. Uh, that changed the sediment supply, the dynamic equilibrium of the beaches was uh, disturbed by. Uh, <coughs> These jetties cut off the supply of sediment here, and this island has actually migrated an island width back since uh, the jetties were constructed. So it's not totally due to sea level rise, but it's a good proxy for what happens when you change one of these elements of the dynamic equilibrium of the beaches. Um, and in this case, the response was landward migration. Uh, what we're concerned about here going forward is that these higher rates of sea level rise that we have no real good modern information. 
information for uh, predicting this, especially if you are a property owner or a federal land manager or a state land manager. Uh, <clears throat> you want to know when and where this kind of thing might happen. It determines whether your Kmart or Walmart or whatever is out in the surf in 25 years or 50, where it's going to be fine. Uh, if you're a land manager uh, concerned about wetlands or beaches or providing public recreation or whatever, you're also concerned about when and where this is going to happen. Uh, at present, we don't have a very good ability to predict this, uh, but we are working on it, and as I'll show you, I think we're getting better. Uh, <clears throat> fortunately, I am a beach person. I do not have to deal with all of the things shown by these red arrows that go into determining whether wetlands are going to be happy or not in response to sea level rise and climate change. It's not just moving around sand. Uh, <clears throat> it's also what happens to the river flows that bring fresh water and sediment into marshes? What happens to the nutrients? Uh, what happens when atmospheric CO2 goes up? There's some evidence that certain marsh plants really like a richer CO2 environment. They flourish at certain kinds of sparse climates, certain latitudes. Uh, that's our common marsh grass around right here. Um, really enjoy having more CO2 to work with. Uh, and there can be disturbance, storms, tides, uh, critters, fire, all those things. Going to determine whether a marsh is going to be happy going into the future, barely keeping up with sea level rise, or like this example from Jamaica Bay, just south of JFK Airport, just eventually give up. Uh, and we lose the, uh, the various benefits that we associate with wetlands in terms of storm buffering and nutrient uh, stores and, and all that uh, from them. Uh, there is also what uh, some people call the flood from below which in many cases is actually driving a lot of our first responses to sea level rise. Uh, <clears throat> as the ocean, particularly on sandy coasts, rises, uh, because salt water is more dense and will go underneath and lift up fresh water, the fresh water table, especially on barrier islands, uh, <clears throat> begins to rise because it's being pushed up by the intruding salt water that comes on the island. So where we have a salt water table today, uh, or a fresh water table today, I'm sorry, um, gets up into the sand and comes up higher, you begin to have impacts like uh, septic system failure, storm drain failure. They don't carry as much water out to sea because there's not a strong enough gradient to carry it out to sea anymore. This obviously has impacts on uh, water quality, infrastructure, and also, very importantly, ecosystem change. Things that are not salt tolerant will move out of the areas that were formerly fresh and be increasingly uh, solidified. Uh, so if you're a manager or you enjoy a certain ecosystem type, or you're reliant for your, uh, your local economy and having a certain kind of coastal ecosystem, uh, <clears throat> understanding when and where this is going to change is going to be very important. Uh, so I hope I've uh, illustrated for you a bunch of things uh, can happen as a result of changing climate and uh, the current changes in, in coasts. Uh, and there are some big dollars associated with what changes will happen and how well we prepare ourselves to mitigate the economic and environmental cost of, of some of these changes. Uh, I got involved in, in this. Uh, this was my first um, hardcore earth scientist poking his head out and trying to be relevant to science policy people. Uh, I got involved in, in trying to figure out a, a challenge to bring basic science to policy relevance. And we decided that a good way to attack that is to understand the modern processes. Uh, that are going on around us, and also learn from the past. Learn from past storms, learn from past uh, episodes of geologic time, uh, etc. And use these things to improve our ability to predict these things like threshold conditions and rates of environmental change, uh, so that we can understand the societal impacts better, and ultimately support decision making so we can <coughs> try to uh, be cost effective and environmentally effective and moving forward. Uh, around the time we finished that report, the National Research Council published a wonderful book uh, <coughs> called Informing Decisions in a Changing Climate. And one of the first things they did was they said, scientists, you need to get on the ball. Your priorities and practices need to change so that you are more relevant to the decisions that the rest of society that supports you needs to make. Um, however, and this is one of the reasons I love the book, they said, they, they told decision makers, scientists are going to blow it. We're going to say something's going to happen, and it's not. We're going to say something's not going to happen, and it is. Expect it. We're fallible. We're going to make these wonderful uh, predictions, and we're going to totally fail. Uh, but sometimes we're going to get it right. You should listen. <laughs> uh, but they said, in order to deal with this, we need some sort of uncertainty management framework. 
because we don't have good predict predictive capability. And this is where uh, my personal light bulb really went on because I've been working with these other climate and policy people uh, who have been learning to talk the language of probabilities of, and relating numerical probabilities of 50% being equal to a coin flip or about as likely as not if you use the IPCC's terminology. And that gave us hardcore science people a means to talk to policy people in the same language. It was like having the Star Trek Universal Translator. All of a sudden, these policy people would look at us and say, is this going to happen? We'd say, oh, it's about as likely as not. And they say, oh, okay, that means 50%, plus or minus a few. Uh, that stinks. Can you do better? And we say, well, over here, it's very likely. And say, oh, that's 70%. Okay, well, we can deal with that. Uh, we won't put our infrastructure here, because if it's 70% likely this outcome is going to happen and it's going to be bad, we'll do something else over there or go somewhere else. So that was huge. Uh, and it makes this problem a lot more trackable uh, because we have driving forces of climate change and sea level rise that are our initial conditions, the coast as it is today. We have all these physical and biological processes that I've uh, talked uh, about this evening. And then there are impacts that range from habitat loss to <coughs> human safety. And there are management decisions that respond to these things, the preservation of habitats or the encouraging of moving of habitats, uh, moving of people, uh, providing first response, things like that. Those are all part of adaptation planning and response, which itself is a driving force. This is like the back of the shampoo bottle, lather, rinse, repeat. Um, <laughs> yeah, you have a new set of initial conditions based on everything that you've just done and everything that has just happened. So you just continuously iterate through this. Uh, and because we're all hopefully speaking the same language, uh, we like that. So what we have begun to do, uh, and I, when I say we, I mean not just the U U.S. Geological Survey, but there's a large community of scientists who are beginning to embrace this approach. Is we are taking all of our storm and wave models and our historical data, this is one example of one particular thing, which is the shoreline, and we're trying to embrace this concept of showing our uncertainty and, and showing how well we know these problems, so we can take models, we can take real-world observations, and we can turn these things in, use, into uh, a variety of things. Uh, <coughs> To communicate our uncertainty over time. Maybe this is months, days, years, or something like that. This is the change in shoreline position. What we have here is our estimate of what's going to happen, the position of the shoreline, and then an uncertainty about that estimate. And this is exactly like the people that we envy most, the hurricane forecasting community, where they give you a five day cone, and maybe like you know, 370 or so days ago, we were at one point in the cone of Sandy, were we not? Uh, <coughs> And then a few days later, the models came up with another one, we tweaked, and then everybody on the Cape anyway breathed the side of the and said, oh, it's only going to be New York. Uh, <laughs> there. Uh, so we're trying to get this kind of information into the hands of people who make decisions, because we think it's an effective way to communicate how much we know about the changes that are coming in the environment, and that helps facilitate planning. But yes, we are clueful about certain things and certain, certain time scales, and we're do less about certain other things. Uh, one of the things that we are doing in the USGS, and I'll touch on this just briefly, uh, <coughs> is trying to model uh, these things at different time scales. So storms, long-term change, and then uh, sea level rise, looking at a variety of environments. Uh, this one is the Outer Banks of North Carolina, which is not unlike certain parts of uh, the landscape around here uh, and down in the Cape as well. Uh, highly dynamic mobile pieces of uh, same real estate. Uh, <coughs> so we're getting better at forecasting the vulnerability to things like uh, Mariah here on the Outer Banks and things like uh, Sandy and, and uh, Northeasters that impact up here as well. Uh, and we identify different regimes that might also ultimately take us to the kinds of threshold events that we're interested in, where maybe if you have a large dune system, we can begin to predict uh, where we expect the collision regime and how much dune erosion or the storm uh, might be expected uh, to uh, incur, um, how much overwash we might expect, and at very high rates of uh, uh, storm impact, how much inundation might ultimately uh, be expected to occur. And we can do this both in scenario form and for real storms, which is a prediction that we did for Hurricane Sandy, where the inner band is how much uh, the probability of erosion, the middle band, which is kind of hard to see here, you can see better here off uh, Southern Long Island. So again, inner band that predicts how much dune erosion, this is how much overwash, and these are places where we expect, red slices out here are places where we might expect to find uh, complete inundation of the island. Uh, and we use National 
work with the National Hurricane Center to produce these kinds of things. Uh, and of course, the scientists only ever show this. So this is a representative example. This is the best one we have. Uh, where you, you made a prediction of uh, a 61% chance that uh, this particular part of the fire island would be inundated, and sure enough, it was totally submerged in a new inlet form there. Um, and so to conclude, what are we going to do with all this information? Well, my particular town, Falmouth, uh, Massachusetts, uh, decided about a decade ago in response to a local environmental activist to not stick its head in the sand. Uh, the Board of Selectmen uh, said, well, you have uh, a concern, it was me, me, somebody else, uh, said you've raised an interesting concern. We are relying on our beaches for tourism, uh, and we have lots of natural resource expectations, public access, expectations, economic expectations about a coastal environment. We want to know how we got to this situation where there is no beach here and what we might do about it in the future. So we, uh, a group of us, which consisted of uh, egghead scientists like me, uh, proper coastal property owners, um, <coughs> uh, there's a banker, an economist, a uh, nature writer, um, all matters, a, a broad swath of our town and, and the town engineer uh, as well, uh, got together and spent a couple of years thinking about where we wanted, where we were, and where we wanted to go uh, in terms of our town. One of the interesting things about the South Shore town, if you're on the Cape, this is what's all down here, uh, is that we own, the town owns the entire sedimentary system. It's all in one political unit. Uh, the source of sediment, the transportation system of sediment, uh, and the ultimate deposition of that sediment is all happens within one political boundary. So we're not beholden to anybody for sand. What somebody does up here with us doesn't matter. What somebody down with uh, will uh, also not be impacted because we have uh, an end to our coastal sediment system right there. Uh, so it makes for a very interesting problem. Uh, what has happened, since, uh, especially since the 40s and 50s, is that as erosion has uh, proceeded along bluff sections that were the sediment sources in this area, uh, bluffs were armored, uh, groins were built, there was overwash, and kinds of things, and ultimately down here, the downstream end of the town, uh, there is a rapid erosion. I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, this is an obstacle point in the 1950s. You can see it's a glacial deposit. It's contributing all kinds of sediment as it's eroded out to the coastal transport system, which goes north up, or sorry, east off the top of the picture. This is what it looked like in, uh, in the 2000s. It's completely wrapped in rock. It's no longer a viable source of sediment, and that has had an impact on the beaches down the river. Uh, and some of our opinion, I included one of the biggest things that uh, the middle of Falmouth, mid to the eastern part of Falmouth, is armored what's called the Falmouth Heights. Um, in 1897, this is a particular kind of glacial deposit that is 100% sand. There's not a boulder in it. Uh, you can actually see this is the angle of repose of unconsolidated sand, pretty much. There's a little bit of fur holding there. And you can see the big wide beach that goes all the way around the thing uh, in 1897. This is the same place in. 2000, it's completely wrapped in rock, it's got ivy and whatnot growing down on it. There's a little bit of beach just on this side because that's where when they dredge the harbor they dump the sand and that's actually not long after they dredge. Uh, but what has happened is that armoring has cut off the supply of sediment and in, in this dynamic equilibrium of beaches, changing the sediment supply has caused the change in the location and the shape of the beach. In this case, a landward change in the shape of the location of the beach, where for uh, hundred years prior to the 1940s, the rate of uh, erosion was immeasurably small. And by the 70s, you could see it at, going at a couple of feet per year. Uh, and you can really see the eastern end of the town, where back in the 1800s, the shoreline was actually out here. It was kind of like a little mini barrier island system along the south shore of Falmouth, with coastal ponds, little barrier islands, and spits and whatnot. Uh, but roughly in, in, the, uh, in the 60s uh, up to the present, uh, that cutoff in sediment supply has actually allowed this, uh, this little barrier spit to retreat behind the headlands that can close it. This is a classic example, just like the north end of Astatee Island in Ocean City, where cutting off the sediment supply has caused this dynamic equilibrium response for the beach to move landward. Uh, in this case, 550 feet landward. If you talk to some of the, uh, the folks who have lived here forever in, in their 90s uh, and upper 80s, they remember horseback races being conducted along a continuous sandy strip. No way that happens now. Most of this is all rock and ruins with no beach even at low tide. Um, and this, this is a very vital coastal system. And if this was done to protect the heights at a time when we didn't have the understanding that we do today, 
of the potential environmental costs of doing various kinds of postal uh, actions. These days, we know better there would be, I think, a more thoughtful examination of the costs and the benefits of taking a particular action. In this case, the cost is a real degradation of the resources uh, in the eastern part of town, and then the water quality of the bays is, is affected as well. Uh, <coughs> so that should be balanced against what we're getting by protecting the right. So we came up with a vision, and what we wanted was beaches and dunes, because it's vital for our particular coastal system. We need sand in the system, we need ways to get we want water quality, we want a minimum of hard structures, so we want maximum flexibility <coughs> in adapting to future changes in sea level. If we try to hold the line somewhere, and it becomes economically untenable, we want to try to avoid having that situation even occur. Uh, we want to get public infrastructure out of the way. Uh, and we want, ultimately, hopefully, a proactive rather than a reactive approach to coastal management. So don't wait till the storm comes in and wipes you out and causes you to do all this coastal disaster stuff. Try to be proactive about your hotspots uh, and have a response protocol when the bad thing ultimately happens. Uh, a big part of this is doing acquisitions. Some properties were bought after Hurricane Bob which obviously predated us, um, but uh, our local land bank came to us not long after the report came out and said, give us your top 10. Well, they bought a couple of them, and we placed a priority on things that were either a potential um, hazard, uh, or most importantly, provided more contiguous town open space for people to access the coast and to recreate along the coast, which obviously drives a good share of town's economic uh, We want to get the infrastructure out of the way. We want to Treat every beach nourishment project as an experiment. We don't have a good track record. All beaches are different. All time periods are different. Uh, we don't want to say we're going to come in and throw this sand here. It's going to last 20 years. We're going to say we're going to throw this sand here. We're going to watch what happens and see if it lasts five days, five years, 20 years, or whatever. Uh, get the bad stuff out of the way that we don't need and try to design effective sand management systems so we have a way to maintain the harbors that we need for our economic uh, maritime commerce, but also supply the sand and the beaches. Don't put it somewhere where we can and improve our regulatory uh, system. So, um, the coast as we know it today is a product of sea level rise. No sea level rise, no Plum Islands, no Plum Island Sounds, no big giant marsh that uh, we all love. Uh, <coughs> major changes are coming to this kind of coastal system. Major changes are coming to all coastal systems in the future. It is a certain impact. We have already dialed in a certain amount of sea level rise uh, going forward over the next several centuries, but it's uncertain, as I hope I've illustrated here. The rates and the magnitudes are, are as yet poorly, uh, poorly constrained, and it's unknown what the societal response will be. One thing I have learned working in the federal sphere over the last uh, eight or ten years on this problem is that uh, there is not going to be a lot of federal money. Uh, it is more apparent now, I think, than ever. Uh, to respond to this, so that if you were down at the county or local level and you were relying on the federal government for your long-term plans, that is probably not a good thing. Uh, the money is going to go to the big city. It's going to go to Boston and New York and Philadelphia and Miami and Galveston and San Francisco and Los Angeles and San Diego uh, and places like Mount Massachusetts and Newbury uh, are going to have to probably uh, take it on themselves. And that's going to be something that we very much need to think about. If there's not a lot of money coming from elsewhere, how do we minimize the economic and environmental cost of what we want our coast to look like? Because it's going to be up to us. And therefore, I think, to conclude, being informed about this is really important. And with that, I thank you for getting informed, and thank you for your attention. I view it.
especially as, as a federal civil servant, and it's part of my job, and you know, I work for you guys. Uh, so I should be out here telling you what I know. You're paying for it. Yes, ma'am. Can, can you talk a little bit more about how your group in Falmouth formed One guy in the fall of 1999, I had only been in town for two years, stood up before our board of selectmen and he said, I think the state of our coast stinks and we should do something about it. And to their credit, the selectmen didn't say, yeah, yeah, thanks, we're fine. Uh, they said, okay, well, let's put together a committee. And they created a charge and advertised it in the paper and I saw it and I said, that just seems like a good way to get back to the board. Just so happened that it was the right mix of science people, town people from different backgrounds, and we all spent. It took us forever to do it. I think the first report was three years, probably. And most of that was just a mutual education. You know, I was a new person in town, and I learned all about the natural and cultural history of the town. So it was a really, really cool group educational process. You now we go out for drinks and all that, and just shoot the breeze about that. Used to look like what it looks like today, where we want everything to go. Um, so there's a lot of playing field leveling, and that was hugely important beginning to have a dialogue uh, together across these various constituencies in the community. And as it turned out, you know, no matter which perspective you came from, you know, whether you were a hardcore environmentalist who wanted you know, nothing more than miles and miles of clover out of that, or you were a business owner who wanted nothing more than miles and miles of beach towels, um, everybody wanted a similar set of things for the town. And it's, it's viable, accessible beaches. Uh, it's a safe environment. It's something you know, the shelter. I, I want clams. Okay, well, what do you have to do to have clams? So it was, it was just a lot of that. It was a, it was a dialogue. And I think we, we were very successful in uh, communicating that. And then we had a receptive year in the town. Uh, has it been as much follow through as it would have liked? Absolutely not. We wanted all our dreams to be realized and to be to see the gravity of what we produce and the usefulness of it and meet in our 100 year plan. Uh, they have, although I'm meeting with the planning board tomorrow uh, about this kind of thing. So it, it's been that, but it really started. The most productive part of it was getting everybody together with all these different perspectives and realizing that we all, in our own way, wanted the same thing. Yes? We have two jetties at the mouth of the Merrimack River that are quite lengthy. And in light of what you said about seawalls, do you consider those akin to a seawall and therefore an encumbrance the beaches? Well, they like certainly, you know, the, the United States has a long history of jetting inlets. And, you know, this one was built, what, the early 20th century, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> there are jetting systems that go back to the 1830s and 40s. Uh, you know, they were built to promote navigation. centuries level of understanding of what are the best ways to try to maximize navigation and not impact other things. The Army Corps of Engineers has a specific class of funding to mitigate damages caused by a navigation project, uh, which recognizes you can always get it right. Um, <clears throat> I think you know, any project like that has the ability, and obviously it happens at the Merrimack, there's a change in the way sediment flows along some probably 10 plus miles. I'm not intimately familiar with what happens in Ipswich Bay, but uh, like the coast. And uh, you know, how you manage with that to get what you want out of the system. You want navigation, you want safety from floods, you want healthy beaches, you want you know, shellfish and everything else. Uh, you know, it requires a conversation about are they doing the job that we want? Are they having acceptable impacts or not? Uh, and, and moving forward from there. Yes? Yeah, following up on that. So this, this has been my contention for a long time. Those jetties were originally a certain length, and they had problems. They extended the length of the jetties uh, to a greater length, and now recently we've spent a good amount of federal money 
to repair the jetties because of the damage on the island and there was a contention that there was water seeping through the jetties and creating a current. But it, it, it's my contention that they're too damn long and they are cutting off sediment. Plus, the Merrimack River in the old days had no flood control structures in, a, in an upriver and a lot of sediment came down the Merrimack River and helped build the beaches. Now we have flood control structures upstream, that sediment no longer gets to the beaches, and we further cut it off by, by these long jetties. And it, it seems to me that these, these, these hard structures you're talking about, and they're, they're hurting this, this beach. They certainly change it, and they can certainly have negative impacts. I mean, you know, it's interesting, while you're talking about the flood control structures, I, my immediate thought is California, where this problem is probably the most thoroughly documented, damming the rivers in California. To supply uh, drinking water uh, and flood control has led to a very well studied and demonstrated uh, increase in the rate of beach erosion and lack of yeah. lack of sediment delivery. Um, <coughs> I do not envy in engineers and geologists who fill around in inlets. They are really hard to get right, and they're very easy to get wrong. <laughs> uh, it's probably one of the more complicated pieces of, of the coastal system. Uh, I think any time you try to engineer and try to uh, predict where these things are going, it, it's, it's difficult to get right. Um, but one of the things that um, you need to be prepared for, or prepared to consider, is actually something that came up in, in the town of Falmouth, where uh, we were presenting some of our results to the selectmen, and one of the issues is groins along the south side of our, uh, one of our major access points into the village of Woods Hall uh, from downtown, where all the emergency services are, are downtown, they need access along this coastal road, which is intermittently flooded and experiences uh, some ongoing rate of change. And one of the selectmen asked me, uh, as I, I was chair at the time and presenting it, he said, you know, if we take all the groins out, would that solve the problem? And I said, no, it actually make it worse overnight, because these groins are the only things that are holding the coastal system together. Uh, and if you take them out, just because you're going to make this commitment to open and natural beaches, that would actually probably be pretty foolish. Uh, because you haven't yet developed a plan for what you're going to do without that road. Uh, and what you're going to do without that road is probably have to build a firehouse over here on this other road to come into town. You know, and, and who thought, you know, who would have thought you know, planning for climate change and sea level rise required building a fire station over here because you've lost this road. So the, the same sort of, uh, I think, thinking needs to go into any plan you might have to alter those days. You've got to do something that you want. Doesn't do what you want. What's going to happen if it doesn't? Um, I can, uh, uh, well, uh, um, yes. a lot of the time, uh, you, you use the fire station example, but electrical substations, you know, all up and down the coast. Should there be a generic rule that says, you know, at least two meters above the flood zone, and if you can, you know where they are. The National grid knows where they are. Next time they upgrade the stuff, they should move it someplace else. I think you know we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of that kind of thinking. Probably one of the most forward-thinking plans that has been put together is the plan that I see document that came out of uh, New York City. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying that this one might be saying this plan to all the time together, um, but it does exactly that. It says, okay, we're going to do this. Let's try to get stuff up and out of the way. Um, I think uh, you also see it. Mixed public response, I think it's Verizon along uh, the New Jersey Barrier Islands is now replacing their copper wires with wireless. And it's driving people crazy because apparently it makes faxes very unreliable. It's present in our nation. Um, you need copper to send fax, I guess. Uh, so, you know, but there's, there's the intent to try to minimize the amount of vulnerability that you have. You said you're a beach guy, so here's a, the beach question. There's a certain amount of political momentum, although maybe not as much financial momentum, to engage in sand mining, which as I understand it would be to relocate sand from below the tide line up onto the dunes. The DEP has come out and said uh, that this could be allowed on an experimental basis, however, 
warning that doing so might deprive other areas of the beachfront that would be normally re-nourished, or naturally be re-nourished, by that sand that is being taken out of the system and put up on the beach. Do you have any thoughts about the practice of sand mining? And I got a barrier island system for you. <laughs> it's called Fire Island, New York, uh, where there has been an ongoing plan, replan, re replan uh, for the Corps of Engineers to uh, conduct large scale beach nourishment offshore. And the principal post, I actually found it part of my postdoctoral research, uh, was assessing the volume of sand that might be available within economic limits to put up on the beach. And one of the things we discovered is there is actually quite a bit of sand out there. <clears throat> but as it turns out, what we have subsequently discovered is that a lot of these uh, sand deposits are actually arranged in these really long, what they call short bases, bad bridges, uh, that appear to serve as conduits for sand on the beach. Because if you look at the history of the change, where these things attach to the beach, the shoreline is kind of stable and accreting compared to the other places. Uh, so one of the things we pointed out in a policy relevant to policy in a fashion is you might want to look before you go mine sand here already helping these beaches along the fire and the um, <coughs> you know, It is totally geologically reasonable, and you know other examples, uh, to expect that process to happen elsewhere. And out here, it's probably no different. You've got a lot of waves, you've got a lot of sand, you've got a lot of bars, a lot of things to move around. Uh, so that is certainly a consideration. Uh, we want to try to have some understanding. And we have modeling and, and uh, observational capabilities that do actually do a very good job of that. Of where sand goes. It gets a little dicey when you get up from the surf zone. The farther out, it gets a little easier. Uh, <clears throat> so you want to you want to look at that. The other big issue is you know, we're now treating the seafloor as a resource, and what other values does it have beyond sand? Is it essential fish habitat? Is it a place where uh, one of the studies that I've worked on in North Carolina, we identified a bunch of uh, what we thought was fairly warm on the bottom. Uh, we showed it to some fisheries people. So that's the number one breeding spot for this kind of thing that, that we know of, and that supports all of these guys who fish for them every spring. So we don't want anybody to go mess around out there. Um, and Massachusetts Coastal Zone Management has done a really good job, actually, to work with them on mapping the inner three miles of state water uh, to allow this very kind of activity to take place. But you can set up a you can set up a big system, topography, and different treatment, things like that. To basically zone, you know, zone the land for agriculture, business, other kinds of uses, we can do the same thing with soup oil. And maybe uh, in that kind of conversation, the same line is more or less favored. situation is everywhere. Right? All, all problems are manifest more usually. Um, you can create pockets that will probably preferentially erode and allow wave energy because you're, at least for a time, changing the slope of the beach. Uh, over the long term, I don't know that we have enough experience yet. You know, I don't think anybody's been beach scraping for 30 years yet uh, to see what that does. But certainly it changes where the sand would naturally be in the coastal system. And that must have an impact to some degree in this dynamic equilibrium. Recognizing that you have to be policy neutral, can you uh, tell us a little bit what you've done with oysters in, in, uh, in Chicago? Uh, as part of our response to
to the, uh, and this is nothing to do with peaches, it has to do with the fact that Bill likes to do oysters and so do I. In response to the, the total maximum daily loads of nitrogen, uh, Falmouth has a number of pilot projects that are looking at ways to make the uh, nitrogen load. And one of them is uh, different types of oyster farming in our streams. And I think that's terrific. Give it a shot. Um, you've got very little to lose and nothing to gain from dinner. And, uh, you know, it, it may help a lot. You know, if you look at the numbers, and you, obviously Woods Hole has a lot of biologists who understand how much oysters can eat, how much nitrogen they can absorb, and all that. And they say, you know, maybe up to a certain point, it, it will help. Uh, and there are other projects that farm algae um, that probably want a measurable net, but that it's it's a good example. Taking low hanging fruit and demonstrating, yes, in certain places you can make this kind of thing work. Uh, so I'm very optimistic about this kind of thing. Give them a shot. They, they have very, very little downside.
priced. So these things can be expected to evolve. Plum Island is partly sand and partly it has old glacial drumlins un under it. Uh, so it can be expected to evolve in a certain way. Um, now where it falls in, in that continuum of dunes to I'll be okay for a while, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, one thing that is quite certain is we don't have a lot of data on what happens to barrier islands like the ones around the Atlantic and the Gulf Coast of the U.S. and 21% of the rest of the world uh, in response to these higher rates of sea level rise. I mean, these things are, as I've showed you, very much a product of a very low rate of sea level rise for the last few thousand years. So if we start measuring that, um, we don't have good modern examples of what happens. We don't have very good ancient examples because they're all underwater offshore and they've been obliterated <laughs> uh, <clears throat> So we, we may be in for a scale of environmental change historically been a very stable coast. Even though you might think the rate of change right now is nothing. It's probably not nearly what it was on sea level horizon. Maybe in the future. Yes. Uh, is there any good science that we could be doing in this area? Uh, uh, mapping, measuring, counting, surveying, anything that would be useful and or are you guys already out here doing something on the line? Uh, as my children would tell you, I'm a total data guy. <laughs> uh, it must be why I'm doing science, not something else. Uh, I think any kind of time series that you can begin to develop <laughs> can be useful. You know, and, and the trick is figuring out what is most important to you. Is it the rate of marsh growth? Is it the rate of have the resources to do it. Uh, Maine's got a great citizen program of surveying beach profiles throughout. They have a web form you enter the data in, and boom, 10 years, you got a decade worth of beach excursion that tells you, in response to this storm, we can expect this much uh, beach retreat and then, you know, this much beach recovery uh, before the next storm. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm all about data and, and understanding and putting it into some sort of longer term context that helps you understand where you've been and where you might go. Right, but there's none of you guys with the USGS uh, thing on. Doing well, like I said, we've done the, um, we've done a, a bit of work uh, mapping the seafloor with, with uh, Mass CZM uh, out here um, from as close as we can get to about the <coughs> uh, shore. Uh, this is not part of our routinely surveyed domain. Most of the projects I work on actually aren't even in Massachusetts. Uh, short of having what's all oceanographic institute here, what should we do? Get a, get, a, get a college here, get, obviously get organized, and can we ask you guys to come? I don't think you should. Sure. They are here. I'll give you my boss's number. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you can get in line. Uh, yeah. Uh, busy folks these days, fortunately. Excuse uh, me, excuse me. We have a group here. I didn't want to interrupt, but there's a group here from Woods Hole. Not here, but they're based in Raleigh. There's a group from Woods Hole. You're, you're probably familiar with them, I don't know. But they're doing the Palm Island Sound area, and they've, they've been very active here for, what, over 10 years, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, now, now, I don't believe that, yeah, I don't believe they've done anything on the beach. But that group is here. Uh, yeah, that's a, my, that's a good segue into my answer. Start local and work your way up. Uh, now, there is no shortage of graduate student labor around. Uh, you know, we are so close to Boston, which is such a huge source of intellectual power. <coughs> um, and there are you know, research sites here. Uh, talk to your local refuge folks. See what concerns they have. Read their comprehensive management plan. See what their goals are. See what research needs are identified. Uh, see whether that translates into what you want out of your building plan. Okay. 
Would you, uh, will you sign in? Would you make a note that you'd like to be involved in that way so that we can follow up? <laughs> right? You will be leading uh, Emory's Thick Beach Profiling <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>